Welcome back, party people, to another broadcast of In the Trenches. Today's guest is Warren Hogarth, who is the co-founder and CEO of Empower Finance. And the Empower app helps entrepreneurs and side hustlers stay on top of their finances, get objective and personalized recommendations to make their money go further, and discover ways to save hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars per year. Prior to launching Empower in 2016, Warren spent eight years as a partner at the number one VC firm in the world, Sequoia Capital. And in today's conversation, we actually explore how Warren got to Sequoia Capital, what it was like to work at Sequoia Capital, including what type of criteria they use to invest in the companies they invest in. And they have such a great track record, it's pretty insightful to see what they actually viewed as the most important criteria. And we also talk about how he transitioned from that to becoming a co-founder of this new app, Empower, and the CEO of Empower Finance. While we talk about a lot of really interesting stuff today, I think the thing that stands out to me is the most important takeaway is that it's important that you set criteria for whatever business you're trying to build. And that definitely you should consider leveraging the insights from successful investors because obviously they're looking for certain things. So if you're starting a company, maybe start by looking at their criteria and evaluate your market using that. Evaluate where your business would stack up when considering the criteria of these bigger investment firms. Now, of course, if you're just doing something as a side hustle, doing something more of a, as a freelancer, a solopreneur, It may seem like that's a little excessive, but I would actually challenge you to maybe look at the criteria that we talk about in today's episode and see what you can do to apply it in whatever project or whatever work you're doing. Because I think at a minimum, it'll be insightful to see just how much room whatever project you're working on has to expand, if not even in a global way or international way, at least in your own market. So without further ado, let's get to it. So Warren, tell me how you got started or what led you to Sequoia in the first place. Give us a little bit of your background and how you got into that world of investing. Yeah, Tom, it's, it's actually a pretty interesting story. So I'm an Aussie. I grew up in Australia, in Brisbane. A lot of my family are from the outback. And, you know, early on, I thought I'd be really planned in my career. I was a chemical engineer as an undergraduate. I was going to go follow what my dad did to chemical engineering, swore I'd never do an MBA, swore I'd never do a PhD. And then all these sort of serendipitous events happened in my life that led me down a path of a PhD so that I could try and develop technology to start a company around that, you know, serendipitously, I got, I won a scholarship to come to the U.S., a Fulbright scholarship. And so I spent a year on exchange here, loved the U.S. Then I had to leave because I was here on a student visa. My goodness, I want to come back. The technology I'd been developing for my, uh, for my thesis was fuel cell technology. We'd hope to start a company, but... When I started, the market was at least five years away, so I knew that wasn't the right thing. Then I uh, applied to come back as a, as a student again and do an MBA as a way to come back to the U.S. and uh, sink my teeth into sort of entrepreneurship. And while hanging out at business school, was spending a ton of time. Um, I was at Harvard at business school. And I was spending a ton of t- time across the river at MIT, working with other sort of engineers and scientists to try and found an interesting business and completely serendipitously ran across a few of the folks at Sequoia. I was um, flying myself out to Silicon Valley to meet other entrepreneurs. I was crashing on a friend's couch. I would send these emails to people to to say, hey, I'm going to be out in Silicon Valley next week. Would you be open to grab a cup of coffee? I'm exploring these ideas. I'd love to get feedback. The truth was I hadn't booked any of my tickets. I was just trying to get a bunch of meetings all lined up. And then I would buy my ticket, call up my friend and say, hey, can I crash on your couch? And through this whole process, I, I uh, ran across uh, a few folks on the team there. We had some conversations, and they s- actually stopped me after uh, the second conversation and said, hey, actually, would you consider doing venture capital? And I said, uh, I wasn't thinking about it, but it's pretty hard to not think about it. When Sequoia, you know, really one of the preeminent venture capital firms that had early investors in Apple and Google and Dropbox and Airbnb, says, hey, would you consider joining us? And so... I remember it was one of those like strange moments. I was sitting in this coffee shop in on Sand Hill Road, and I called up my parents back in Australia, and I said, you know what, I might be staying in the U.S., and that's how I got into venture capital. Very interesting story. When you got started there, how competitive was the atmosphere there? Because I assume it's probably not, oh, you get in, and then you just kind of coast. I Presumably, this would be a very challenging work environment. So tell me a little bit about that kind of experience and kind of what you learned from that. Yeah, you know, venture capital and, and the way... You know, there's eight people really on the 
venture capital team at Sequoia, they bring on one new person every two to three years. It's an apprenticeship model where you have a few mentors, you follow them around, they teach you, they guide you in the craft, give you feedback as you sort of become better and more proficient and better able to help companies, to pick companies, to champion investments. You know, you sort of graduate and you start leading investments and joining boards. It's an amazing environment. Like you, you'll learn from some of the smartest minds in the business. Yeah, it's an extremely challenging environment. And, you know, I joined in 2008 and two months later, I closed my first investment and the following day, Lehman Brothers collapsed and the global financial crisis hit hard. And about, you know, a week later, we'd called in all our portfolio company CEOs and said, hey, we did this presentation that was supposed to be private called Rest in Peace, Good Times about how we needed to batten down the hatches and prepare for like a recession. And that also just massively changed just the whole landscape. And we went, even as a industry, went into a mode of how can we make sure the companies that we've already invested in stay alive and make sure they're financed to be able to come out the other side. And so it was just an interesting time internally as you're learning. And it was an interesting time in the industry, just thinking about, okay, how do we help these companies make sure they come out of this? And, you know, just by the mere chance that you survive, you're likely to come out on top as one of the few left standing. Interesting. You were at Sequoia for how long? Just shy of eight years. Gotcha. When did you kind of hang your hat and transition on? You know, I had an amazing time and had seen a full cycle of venture capital in that period of time. So, you know, the founders of Airbnb came in in 2009. It's quite famous. They had knocked on maybe 100 doors to try and raise a few hundred thousand dollars. And we were the first seed check of $600,000 that we wrote into the company. And, you know, fast forward to the end of sort of 2015, beginning of 2016, you know, you've got a, you know, these multi billion dollar unicorns. So I've seen, how these companies grow. And also personally, at the same time, my first child was born and you have this sort of reflective moment of, okay, what are your priorities? What do you want to be doing in your career? And I had learned so much, but I always, I've always had this itch to scratch about, you know, going back to being the operator and building companies and being the person in the center of the ring rather than the coach. At the same time, I was seeing this massive disruption in consumer financial services. I'd been on the board of a company called Sunrun, one of the largest consumer finance companies for solar in the country, which had just gone public. Another company in the robo space called Future Advisor. And we had invested in Stripe and Square and Klarna, these, these companies that were massively disrupting financial services. And ever since I arrived in the country, I hated the finance system in the US and I've always wanted to build a business to try and shake things up. And I just thought, it's a great time. Externally, there are these wonderful tailwinds, wonderful momentum. And personally, it was one of these opportunities that, you know, I wanted to go back while uh, I still had a lot of energy and, and try and build an enduring business and take what I'd learned from venture and, and apply that to my own business. I love that. I want to get into Empower in just a second. But before we do, presumably the way these companies work, you are looking for that unicorn, right? At least that's, that's what it's like from the outside. And now there are fundamentals, of course, that you're looking for or that you have to weigh and criteria that you're reviewing. But I think it seems like that the hope is there's always going to be at least one or all of them. You're only investing in them if they have actually the ability to really blow up, it sounds like. So take me through that process of like the criteria you look at and kind of how you process like this has the ability to be that kind of unicorn versus, hey, these are good companies, but they're just not right for investment capital. You know, it's quite intimidating when I arrived at Sequoia. One of the uh, the stats that uh, we shared with entrepreneurs is the companies where we'd been the first check were now now made up 20% of the market cap of the NASDAQ. And so it was very much the criteria, you know, we were making a handful of investments a year, about 10 investments per year with the goal of building companies that would be around in 10 or 20 years time and you could measure the market cap in billions of dollars. And so, you know, for us, the criteria was it generally had to be a technology-based company because those were the kinds of companies that could have that kind of explosive growth. Technology-based or technology-enabled, if you think of a Uber or a DoorDash or something like this. So technology-enabled, it had to have the market size, either an existing market that it was going to disrupt or something we believed would change or create some kind of new that could be measured in the billions of dollars if you sort of did this bottom-up math of, you know, 
this many people times this many dollars per person, et cetera. And then it was a question of team. Do we think there was like that sort of very unique DNA, these sort of people founders often are, you know, a couple of standard deviations away from the mean in how they think in all different directions, whether it be introverts or extroverts, tenacity, grit, hunger, depth in, in a specific technology or breadth of understanding of broad markets. And then finally, we had to believe the market had wonderful tailwinds. And so, you know, the analogy we would use is, let's say you're the, you're the best surfer in the world. If you're, you're still dependent on the wave, if it's like a three foot break, you can be the best surfer in the world, but somebody else catches a 10 foot, like perfect break going in the right direction, you know, much easier to ride a, one, ride a wonderful wave than, than something where you're kind of pushing the market. And so those would be the core criteria we would look at when we were assessing an investment. So tell me this, is there any that you look back on now having gone through that transition where all those criteria were met, but the thing still didn't pan out and maybe in a, in a way that you found like was really unexpected. So any big, like huge failures or huge busts <laughs> that come to mind, whether you want to share the name or not, and kind of what your take on it was. You know, we aren't taking enough risk if we weren't, you know, writing off about 30% of our companies because, you know, we're looking mm. to make 10 to 100 times our money. So you have to take big bets. And so there were plenty that, you know, that didn't work out. I think for me, you know, early on in 2008 and 2009, you know, there was this huge interest in renewable energy. And I had invested in one companies in the space, some solar companies actually. You know, amazing technology, amazing founders, the tailwind seemed right. But what happened, there were like 350 odd solar companies in Silicon Valley and almost none of them succeeded. I think you can count them on one hand, the number that succeeded. And that's because over across the pond in China, they were also in this race. They had two other advantages. They could move very, very fast and they could access billions and billions of dollars in capital, both in terms of bonds and government subsidies and otherwise that allowed them to come down a cost curve and a manufacturing efficiency curve faster than the technology could be developed over here. And that was just one of those things that's like completely outside your control and it's very painful. But, uh, you know, we've seen plenty of ups and downs of, of companies that, you know, don't get out the gates or have a strong start, but something goes wrong. Yeah, we have experienced plenty of that. When you talk about well, the first criteria is technology app or technology enabled, how has that changed or, or shifted over the last, I would say, maybe like, I guess, seven years or a decade since you kind of got your start investing in companies like Airbnb? Like, you know, again, presumably a company like Airbnb knocks on the door. Maybe it's not the right fit anymore. Well, especially in that market, of course, because Airbnb is the dominant force. So like, has that shifted and changed at all? And kind of what are you looking at now in terms of something with regards to technology app or technology enabled? Yeah, I think, you know, I would actually say that it's, Generally, right now, investors are more comfortable with what I'd consider more technology-enabled services than they were 10 years ago. I think there was still back then a very strong bias to what I'd consider sort of deep technology, you know, people writing a new file system or a network layer or like a new camera piece of hardware that would allow something magical to happen. And that was, you know, a lot of semiconductor history as well in Silicon Valley. I think what Airbnb and Uber and, you know, more recently, you know, a DoorDash or a number of these other companies, which are really, they're sort of using software to mobilize people in very different ways, in very distributed and efficient ways that weren't possible in the past. They're a different kind of business. The deep technology business used to be this high gross margin business that you spend a bunch of upfront money, but if, if it works, you know, you make 80% gross margins. These knowledge-enabled software businesses, and they have to scale very, very fast. They tend to be much lower gross margin companies. You know, they're market, more like marketplace companies where there's a 10 to 20% you know, take rate. They're very different profile, but I think people are much more willing to take that bet now than they were in the past. And it's, it's, it's able to be more successful than it was in the past. And that's really driven mostly by mobile. Yeah. Okay. So good, I think, time to segue to Empower. Share with the listeners who aren't familiar with the app a little bit about it and a little bit of the why behind it. And, and specifically, not only the why for, of course, the customer and that, but when you use this criteria that you were judging like other companies on, how maybe you've approached the building and the creation of Empower 
kind of looking at these criteria. So through that lens as well, I'd love to kind of hear your perspective on how Empower is actually, you know, meeting all these criteria that you're looking at. Sure. So Empower is, you know, it's, it's supposed to be the one finance app that you have on your phone that does everything for you. It, you know, it aggregates all your bank, your credit card, your loan and investments, crypto investments into one place. But rather than sort of like the Mint or the uh, you know QuickBooks and other apps of old, there's two really important differences that we think set things apart of this sort of new wave. The first one is, you know, we've done a lot of work on the data structuring technology, artificial intelligence behind it, so that we take the data and we we give you recommendations on what to do to save hundreds, some people thousands of dollars per year. And we automate all of that. So it's just like having that trusted sibling that, you know, knows and does an amazing job with their finances, like always looking out. So, you know, your credit score improves, your income goes up, you know, we'll tell you the minute you can refinance your loan and save and who it should be with and how much you would save. And then the second key piece is that in a few taps, you can take action on that and capture those savings. So if you go back to those, that criteria of of like what's really important one of the huge sort of secular shifts happening in financial services right now is there's API layer being built in financial services. So the ability for me to plug into banks, credit cards, loans, all of these various accounts with security and permissions that are sanctioned by the various banks to pull down that information on an ongoing basis to make those decisions and also the APIs then to be able to execute on them, to just simply say, hey, okay, you want to refinance your loan? Do you want me to send your information over there to populate everything and bring you back an offer? And if you say yes, we can just send that over so you're not jumping off to a web page, spending 10 minutes filling out forms, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's really about sort of breaking down the barriers in financial services. And so we've seen one of the advantages I had was sort of seeing a lot of this change happen you know, with Square in for small business payments, Stripe for developer payments, a number of new loan companies. So there's fundamental shift happening on the technology side. It's a huge market. The 20th largest bank in the country has $20 billion in market cap. So if we do one important piece right, we can build a very, very large company. And then from the consumer side, there's also this massive change. You know, If you consider a millennial generation, which I just scrape into, the way the financial system was built wasn't to serve this generation. FICO doesn't work for people who don't want to have credit cards or don't have a lot of credit history. Lending doesn't work for anyone who's a contractor and has contract income because every lender asks you for, like, let's see, two years of W-2 income. It was built in a time where we didn't have the data to make smart decisions. Now that we have this data, we can do all of this and we can provide services for people that aren't well served by the financial system. So we saw this huge change in sort of demographics and trends where the large four banks are amongst the least loved brands by millennials. And this huge change in the industry where we can plug into the banks in the same way that, you know, like when Android and iOS software platforms were launched and they plugged into telecommunications infrastructure, Verizon and what have you, we can build new services on top, the kinds of services that people want and they trust so that they don't have to go into the banks anymore. Okay. So this is interesting. This is obviously a very competitive industry. And again, there are kind of like entrenched players. What are you guys doing to kind of disrupt them or get in front of an audience that might already have, you know, some of your competitors already installed in their phone? Because I know that's kind of one of the toughest things to do when it comes to software is actually just getting somebody to switch to another app. So what are your growth channels right now? Like, what are you focused on? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because a traditional financial services firm might spend 300 to $500 to acquire a customer. And, you know, we want to be able to acquire customers for one one hundredth that, and we are today. And so you really have to think about what are your strategic advantages as position. And like one of the really big ones for us is mobile. Because traditional financial services company are not able to acquire users in a mobile channel. They don't have an app where you can download and open a new account in a frictionless way. And that's why you see like, you know, similar apps. We don't really compete like Robinhood, for example, in the stock trading side of things be so successful versus a Schwab or a Fidelity or a Vanguard. They know how to acquire in the channel. They know how to design for mobile. They don't just take a web service and throw it in. And when, you know, again, if you focus on people under 35, 80% of them only use mobile for personal browsing. 
And then the second big thing for us is working out how to use social channels really well at the same time, because again, that's where people are spending so much of their time right now. So it's understanding how to do distribution in, you know, whether it be Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Pinterest, et cetera, do all of that really, really well so that you become recognized and, and, and grab mindshare from people. And do you guys envision this being something that could be a competitor with something like PayPal and go the almost like the digital banking route as well? My understanding of it as I look at it is right now it's tracking all your your financial data. It's a one one stop shop on your phone or mobile to manage a lot of that. But in terms of like you also mentioned things like cryptocurrencies, some other stuff that sounded kind of interesting. So what's like the big kind of path here and, and what are you trying to achieve in the next like say one to three years? Yeah, look from our point of view that you know we offer you the ability to see everything in one place, get advice, and then take action. We allow you to keep your money wherever it is, whatever your bank is, or whatever your investment company is, and leave it there today, but take action from within that And once we provide you the recommendations and decisions. The close analog actually is probably not PayPal. It's a company called Alipay in China, where it's really the one-stop shop for folks in China to do all of their banking and investing. And so we are progressively adding more and more functionality so that you can do everything you need to in terms of taking actions on the advice from within our application. And what that means is, you know, we found that people aren't particularly loyal to where they are today. They just want to get the best deal. And so if that you can say, I mean, we've literally saved users over $3,000 a year by whether it be negotiating on their phone bills our average users that have this or sort of an auto save set up with us, which allows you to say, hey, set aside five or ten percent of my paycheck every month. They're saying over saving over twelve hundred bucks extra per year that they weren't saving otherwise. They're saving it into high interest savings accounts rather than leaving it sitting at Chase. And on the crypto side, so we just turned on yesterday actually the ability to connect your Coinbase account and see all your Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum balances on the crypto side of things. So it really provides you that holistic view so you can make intelligent and informed decisions. And then they get, as I said, sort of we're layering on more and more of the functionality to take action. And then how does the company itself, like how will you, you know, it sounds like it's free to use. People don't have to pay to, to sign up. Where's the, again, I know you guys are probably pre-revenue or however you describe that piece of it. Where, where is the, does the profitability come from? Is it after a certain number of users that are using the platform? I'm really curious about that from somebody who's always been interested in the tech space and, and seen a lot of these software companies come and go and, and those that are pre-revenue for a while come and blow up, of course, and become like really big. How do you guys look at that and where is the profit for Empower? Yeah, there's a, there's a few ways. So one is, you know, we have this uh, feature right now where we help you negotiate bills that we believe that you're overpaying. And, you know, again, the average savings we're seeing is about 250 bucks per year where we do that for the user. So this is a cable or a phone or a satellite radio bill. You can go and do it by yourself if you like. That's free. We will do it for you if you like. If we're able to find savings, we have to be able to share in those savings and charge a percent of what we save you. If we don't save you any money mm. on the negotiation, you don't pay anything. And then similarly, you know, you know, one of the easiest ones is you know, a good chunk of our users have a bunch of money sitting in a savings account as an emergency fund or for, for a rainy day fund but it's not earning any interest. And we will say, hey, just why don't you move that money over to, you know, Goldman Sachs Bank and make 1.3%, you know, save an extra, whatever, 150 bucks a year that you might do. We, on those recommendations, if you open one of those accounts, the bank will pay us a commission or a referral fee. Our commitment is to only make recommendations that we would make to my mother-in-law, like, She's one of the people I'm always helping out with these things. Like, is that sort of level of sort of integrity in the, making those recommendations? But the nice thing is when we get you the right product, that often means that we, we can make or get paid from doing that at the same time because those are really tightly aligned. And then you guys are, I know you were doing a lot of the, the AI behind the scenes, which is really fascinating. But one of the things I find is pretty interesting too is those relationships with the, the stuff that's already exists, like here and the present, like banks like that. So- are you guys like scavenging all the, the banks that are already out there, their accounts, like what they offer for like interest and savings accounts, et cetera, et cetera? Or does it come down to kind of like working strategic partnerships with that? And because it seems like once you get on this, it would be a, if I'm a bank, it seems like this would be a great lead gen source 
for new people to bank with us. For example, like that one scenario you gave. So it seems like really compelling from the bank side of things, but I'm curious how that's developed and, and some of the things you've run into doing that piece of it. Honestly, it sort of splits. There's banks that aren't particularly happy because they don't offer the best products for consumers. You know, in, in banking, the, the status quo is some kind of, you know, leading product, like a nice checking account or what have you, then try and, you know, once you've got people, get them into other products where they're clearly not best in market, but you and you make a ton of money on them. There's 16,000 banks US and almost all of them act like that. There's a handful of banks, a few banks that really do offer best in class products. Those are the folks that are really happy with us where we can be a, a really good source of, of new customers. And so we have to walk a, you know, a fine line, but you know, we want to sit on the side of the consumer. We want to be you know, your consigliere. Again, it's sort of the same decisions that we would make for ourselves I mean, sort of optimizing all of our own finances. And so to get that data, we have to go to a bunch of different sources. And that's sort of part of what we're doing behind the scenes is connecting a lot of different pipes. And there's a lot of work. Some of them are sort of nice, clean APIs. Some of them were written 20, 30 years ago and, you know, are pretty ugly. But uh, if you do work, the data is actually not very clean when it comes in. Another one of the key things we have to do is we do a lot of our own proprietary data cleaning and, and pipeline that sits on top of that so that you know that, you know, this transaction that says uh, Uber, you know, 16th May star XY345 is not just, you know, some bit of text written down that that's actually, you know, Someone took an Uber that day and, you know, that's a technology company, you know, all of that work. It's mind blowing how basic all of the data that comes out of these institutions are and that they don't know what's what. And so just cleaning that up. And then we actually, similarly, our users, every time somebody sort of categorizes a transaction, our system, if we didn't already know what it was, that not only remember that user, but it teaches our system. So, you know, every other uh, user that benefits from that going forward. Very interesting. Okay. So I just got the app on my phone. I'll be playing around with it very shortly, but come in, I know up to time that I have with you today. So let me give you the floor too, to share a little bit more about Empower. If there's anything else you want to share um, that you think is relevant for kind of the end listener here, that entrepreneur, online business owner, anybody who's kind of trying to be their, their core business, is there something that is Empower, something that they should use and, and why? I'm a you know, small business owner myself right now. And it's, you know, two big things. One is most people don't have the time to stay on top of your finances, but you know that you should be. And so that's really how it does in the background. And we push you again, these alerts when we've found ways for you to save, and then you can just take action seamlessly from within the app. So it's just a great thing to have on your phone, sitting in the background and to just, you know, wait till there's something that's pushed your way or when there's a way to save. And then the second big thing that we've been working on is, you know, for business owners, whether it be you have contract income, like we're working on a bunch of ways and partners to make sure that you don't get screwed just because you have contract or 1099 or side hustle income when it comes to sort of loans and credit cards and what have you. But also, um, you know, we have a category for business expenses and we're going to be doing more to make it easier when you do have to split out and work out, you know, what were your personal expenses, what were your business expenses, whether you're deducting them or just trying to track your personal spending so you know whether you're, you're, uh, you're, you're making ends meet at the end of the month. We've sort of we've taken all of those into consideration as we're building power. So, you know, we're very welcome to feedback too from, uh, from other entrepreneurs. So if anyone does give it a whirl and uh, has some feedback, we'd, uh, we're all ears. I love it. Well, Warren, this has been fantastic. Where can people reach out to find you or check out Empower? Yeah, it's, I mean, just it's on iOS and Android. If you uh, go into the App Store and search Empower or Empower Finance, you'll find us. It's you know, we're a five star rated app. You know, anyone can reach me uh, if you just to, at Warren at Empower dot me. We'd love any feedback. I love it. Well, Warren, thank you so much for being on in the trenches with us today. It's fantastic, Tom. Have a great day.